Good morning. Good to see y'all. Thanks for being here on this beautiful October Sunday morning. Uh, this is the 11 o'clock service. We're online and we're also here in person. My name is Pastor Josh Kessner. I'm the campus pastor here at University Lutheran Church. Pastor John Heiliger, the parish pastor, will be preaching later on in the service. And this is just a great day. If you were up a little bit earlier today, you might have seen the homecoming house from Bowman Field that they built all during the week. Uh, moving towards Liberty. Uh, they take it, it's just short enough to get under the, the stoplights, I think, which is exciting. Uh, but it went all the way out there, and we've got a lot of people in our church that have been working on that house all week. Uh, Pastor John was out there most days, a lot of people at the early service, Bob Healy, Augie Tortora, Roger Liska, I saw him a couple times. So a lot of people who have been helping out, um, Mary ben Marion Benton and some others were helping out at the check-in table, a lot of you have donated Gatorade or money throughout the last couple of weeks. So thank you for your support for that. Uh, it's something that's exciting every year to have that homecoming Habitat House build on Bowman Field, right so that everybody can see it. Um, and I know all the students on, on Clemson's campus had a good time working on it and looking at it. So thanks for that. If you still have any donations, we're still taking them in the, the offering plate for Habitat and you can just note it in the memo and we'll send all our bulk money at some point. The offering plate is just on the big circle back there. A lot of people ask where they can give their offerings and we never make a great big announcement of where that is. <laughs> but there is a basket on the big circular table out there. Um, later today at 3 p.m. we're gonna have a blessing of the animal service just out in that little circular area under the trees outside. Um, and the blessing of the animal service is fun and it's a way to celebrate St. Francis's feast day which is actually tomorrow. Um, but we'll do that as a way to appreciate creation. So we love the trees, we love the sky, we love the rain, and we mostly love all these little pets that we have at home. Um, so feel free to bring your dog, your cat, any animals that you have, a picture of a pet that you might have that you might not want to bring, a picture of your favorite animal. Mine is the bison. Um, so just, just join us for the blessing of the animal service at 3 p.m. just in that little circular area out there. And one more announcement is that Pastor John will be going on vacation for a couple of weeks starting tomorrow. Um, so you won't see him for a few weeks, but it's just because he's hopefully getting a little bit of restful time away. Um, so if you have anything you need to reach out to a pastor for, you can call me. My name and number should be in the bulletin or online. Uh, hopefully you have it by now. But um, it's just good to, to be here in this way. So I, I will be your pastor, solo pastor, for the next couple of weeks. And we hope that Pastor John has a nice couple of days away. If there are no other announcements for the good of the congregation, then let's prepare our hearts for worship with the sound of the bell choir.
Beautiful, thank you. I invite you to stand as you're able and face the baptismal font for these words of confession and forgiveness. Blessed be the Holy Trinity, one God, whose teaching is life, whose presence is sure, and whose love is endless. Amen. Amen. Let us confess our sins to the one who welcomes us with an open heart. God, our comforter, like lost sheep we have gone astray. We gaze upon abundance and see scarcity. We turn our faces away from injustice and oppression. We exploit the earth with our apathy and greed. Free us from our sin, gracious God. Listen when we call out to you for help. Lead us by your love to love our neighbors as ourselves. Amen. All have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. By the gift of grace, Christ Jesus, God makes you righteous. Receive with glad hearts the forgiveness of all of your sins. Amen. Amen. The gathering hymn today is How Firm a Foundation. <laughs> grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with you all.
Let us pray. Sovereign God, you have created us to live in loving community with one another. Form us for life that is faithful and steadfast, and teach us to trust like little children, that we may reflect the image of your Son, Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord. Amen. Amen. Y'all may be seated, and we'll sing this psalm responsibly, led by James. Today's first reading is from the second chapter of Genesis. The Lord God said, It is not good that the man should be alone. I will make him a helper as his partner. So out of the ground the Lord God formed every animal of the field and every bird of the air and brought them to to the man to see what he would call them. And whatever the man called every living creature, that was its name. The man gives names to all cattle and to the birds of the air and to every animal of the field. But for the man, there was not found a helper as his partner. So the Lord God caused a deep sleep to fall upon the man and he slept. Then God took one of his ribs and closed up its place with flesh. And the rib that the Lord God had taken from the man he made into a woman and brought her to the man. Then the man said, This at last is bone of my bones and flesh of my flesh. This one shall be called woman, for out of man this one was taken. Therefore a man leaves his father and his mother and clings to his wife, and they become one flesh. This is the word of the Lord. The Holy Gospel according to St. Mark, the ninth chapter. Some Pharisees came and to test Jesus, they asked, Is it lawful for a man to divorce his wife? He answered them, What did Moses command you? They said, Moses allowed a man to write a certificate of dismissal and to divorce her. But Jesus said to them, Because of your hardness of heart, he wrote this commandment for you. But from the beginning of creation, God made them male and female. For this reason, a man shall leave his father and mother and be joined to his wife, and the two shall become one flesh. So they are no longer two, but one flesh. Therefore, what God has joined together, let no one separate. Then in the house, the disciples asked him again about this matter, and he said to them, 
Whoever divorces his wife and marries another commits adultery against her. And if she divorces her husband and marries another, she commits adultery. People were bringing little children to him in order that he might touch them, and the disciples spoke sternly to them. But when Jesus saw this, he was indignant and said to them, Let the little children come to me. Do not stop them, for it is to such as these that the kingdom of God belongs. Truly I tell you, whoever does not receive the kingdom of God as a little child will never enter it. And he took them up in his arms, laid his hands on them, and blessed them. The Gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, o Christ. Please be seated. I will have a children's message, although there are children here in the sanctuary, or at least not by age. <laughs>
those of you at home, I was so concerned about the camera and the milkweed, I got two out of three and forgot to turn my microphone on. So I'll use that children's message again, but I hope you at least saw the visuals. <laughs> I imagine that for many of you, if not most of you, before I utter a single word or make a single observation with reference to today's gospel reading, specifically Jesus' words regarding divorce, you already have a story of your own or stories of someone you know circulating in your minds. These stories may have to do with your own divorce, the divorce of your parents, or the divorce of someone you love and care about, family or friends. So I'm going to ask you to do something that's rather hard to do, and that's to temporarily put those stories on hold so we can first look at the text and the context and then if I live up to my uh, teachings of my preaching professor, sharing God's word, which comes to us in the form of law and gospel, command and promise, which com commands and promise that always, always shares a bit of good news with us or a word of hope, or we all would be lost. So please hang on just for the next few minutes or so. So the context of today's story is that Jesus' adversaries, this time some of the Pharisees, are looking to test Jesus, not learn from him or engage in a spirited dialogue as was common among rabbis and religious leaders, and it's still practiced by Lutheran rostered leaders around a picnic table and beverages, some of those beverages being of the malted variety, no, the Pharisees are seeking to test Jesus. Pastor Josh and I have shared the importance of geography in Mark's gospel. And where this test occurs is in the region where previously John the Baptist had spoken out against King Herod's infidelity. So it's, it's one thing for me to rail against the Pope or the president in the safety and obscurity of my own backyard. It's quite another to shout those objections in the middle of St. Peter's Square or on the doorsteps of 1600 Pennsylvania Avenue. Geography, where one is saying things, does contribute to the magnitude or the weight of the situation. So here are some of the Pharisees testing Jesus about marriage, where previously John the Baptist spoke the truth. And that had resulted in him being imprisoned and then executed. So right off the bat, one may argue that it is not necessarily the subject matter of the test that is of greatest importance, Jesus' teaching on divorce. But the fact that some of the Pharisees had identified a politically sensitive issue that they were now trying to pin Jesus down on. Could they entrap Jesus and force him down the same path that John the Baptist went? Another observation to share about context is that in Jesus' day, there were two prominent rabbis who through historical records, we know what they were teaching regarding divorce. There was Rabbi Hillel who said a husband could only divorce his wife if she had committed adultery and vice versa. And there was Rabbi Shammai who allowed for a husband to divorce his wife for virtually any reason. The pinnacle patriarchal position, the man is the king of the household, so what he says goes up to and including his own wife. Now the Jewish wife of the time did have a marriage contract to somewhat buffer them from the greatest of economic hardship of divorce. But I doubt the average divorce settlement would have set her up for life. Depending on her gifts and talent, this may very well put her in a more precarious and vulnerable position. Around the world in some cultures of today, where women's education is frowned upon or even illegal, for a woman to be cast out of the home leaves her with very few options. 
which is why so many are forced into compromising positions, if not thoroughly exploited through human trafficking for illegal and soul-destroying activities. So to summarize up to this point, the Pharisees are testing Jesus and divorce is the topic they have chosen. There are at least two very divergent accepted teachings on divorce from rabbis in Jesus' day. And third, when women are viewed more as property versus the helpmate as described in Genesis, economics also comes into play. When the Pharisees asked Jesus, is it lawful to divorce, for a man to divorce his wife, Jesus refers them back to Moses, which is a pretty savvy move because Jesus knows that the Pharisees have great respect for the Torah, the first five books of the Bible, also called the books of Moses. The Pharisees, knowledgeable in the law, get the answer right, technically speaking. Yes, Moses did allow for a certificate of divorce to be written, but Jesus tells them they missed the greater point. God's intent for when two become one, when someone has found their helpmate, someone who loves and respects them, someone who will sacrifice on behalf of the good of the other. This is to be a lifelong relationship. That is the ideal. No news here. We are all human and we all will fail in a wide variety of ways, including sometimes in marriage. Jesus points out to the Pharisees, this certificate of divorce was included as an option because of our hardness of heart. The certificate of divorce actually provided an important measure of protection for the divorced woman, that she could seek remarriage and not be forever ostracized. But through Jesus' words, it seems to me that God's hope would be that the two who have become one remain as one through the length of their lives, that the relationship would be life-giving enough to both parties to weather the bad times and celebrate the good times. But we know from either our own personal experience or from those who are close to us that this is not always the case. In my own extended family, we've had several marriages end in divorce due to addiction, infidelity, or driving each other to the verge of mental collapse. The prospective pitfalls are numerous. I really can't think of a single divorce among those I know who were simply tired and looking for a convenient way out. No, the process was arduous and rife with painful moments. Anyone who has gone through divorce will tell you it is not convenient. And even when done for the most understandable and justifiable of reasons is not without pain. So how does God react to God's children who are in pain and suffering? Chastise them? Berate them? No, we humans do that quite enough all on our own, usually toward ourselves, but sometimes spilling out onto others. No, the God we see in Jesus even though clear in the intent of marriage to be lifelong, in Jesus is a God who draws close to those who are in pain, draws close to those who are suffering. This is the God who willingly laid down his life for others. Well, after the encounter with the Pharisees, Jesus is back in the house with the disciples and people are trying to bring children to see Jesus that he might touch them. Throughout Mark's gospel, we have stories of Jesus healing others through his touch. So it's not too much of a stretch to think that many of these kids coming to Jesus were also in need of healing. The disciples try to stop it for whatever reason, but Jesus would have no part. He became indignant. Jesus got upset about the unfair treatment towards the children. Let the children come to me and do not stop them, for it is to such as these the kingdom of God belongs. 
the children who are so easily overlooked or looked down upon by others, the hurting ones, weak and helpless and vulnerable. And Jesus took them up in his arms, laid his hands on them, and blessed them. We are all children of God. St. Ignatius had a spiritual practice of placing oneself in the scripture story, using our imaginations to allow our hearts to seek out their feelings and not simply rely on our intellect as a means of understanding. So an exercise that you may want to try this week is to imagine yourself either now or sometime in the past as being hurt, being weak, helpless or vulnerable. And then can you imagine Jesus embracing you in his loving arms, extending healing and if warranted forgiveness so that you can be restored. Have you ever been given a hug or gave a hug to someone who in times of grief or hopelessness, and you can feel some of the burden being lightened, some of the isolation melting away in the arms of a friend. We all mess up. It's part of our human condition. But we can also extend grace, forgiveness, mercy, and be part of God's healing for one another and for a hurting world. Hopefully, we can imagine Jesus taking us into his loving arms, laying his hands on us and blessing us and sending us forth to do the same. For God is love. Jesus is the incarnation of that love. And we, as the body of Christ, on earth at this time and in this place are called to share God's love with everyone around. Amen. who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended to the dead. On the third day he rose again, he ascended to heaven, and is seated at the right hand of the Father, and he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Made children and heirs of God's promise, we pray for the church, the world, and all in need. Holy One, you have raised up faithful leaders throughout history. Empower those discerning a call to ministry and all seminarians, that they continue to be formed for the sake of the gospel. Lord, in your mercy, you have established a diverse and beautiful creation. Revive declining species and preserve endangered lands. Cultivate in us a sense of wonder for the world you created. Lord, in your mercy, you desire for us not to be alone and to live in community with one another. Strengthen relationships between nations and peoples that we celebrate and support one human family. Lord, in your mercy. You share in our experiences and struggles. Bless all who live with any mental or physical disability. Inspire creative communities spaces and environments that are accessible and hospitable. Give comfort to anyone in need of healing in mind, body, and spirit, especially Marie, 
Barbara, Carol, Karen, Jimmy, Martha and Nancy, Larry, Alton, Scott, Greg, Gail, Pat, Rosalind, Tony, Randy, Joyce, Gary, Cece, Margaret, Joanne, and Christopher and Ellen at the birth of their child. And all the we, those we name now with our lips are in our hearts. Lord, in your mercy, you have established and nourished relationships that extend beyond those gathered today. Bless members who can no longer travel to worship with us and remind us of their continued role in this community of faith. Lord, in your mercy, God of hope, Continue to fill us with your hope in the midst of a pandemic. We pray for all of your children who have suffered and continue to suffer because of it. We give thanks and ask for your love to touch those who work endlessly in hospitals and other health care facilities. We pray for Jennifer, Molly, Julie, Bill, Stephanie, Cindy, Lee, Lawson, Beth, KD, Kathy, Donnie, Smith, Patrick, John, Trey, Jen, Leslie, Mike, Beth, Hannah, Tiffany, and Joseph. Lord, in your mercy, Hear other intercessions may be offered here. You promise eternal life to all your children. Thank you for the people of faith who have gone before us. Strengthen our trust that we have in you. Lord, in your mercy. Amen. Receive these prayers, O God, and those in our hearts known only to you through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Amen. The peace of Christ be with you always. And also with you. Let's share that peace with one another. Let us pray as we prepare our hearts for communion. You are indeed holy, almighty, and merciful, God. You are most holy, and great is the majesty of your glory. You so love the world that you gave your only Son, so that everyone who believes in him may not perish, but have eternal life. We give you thanks for his coming into the world to fulfill for us your holy will, and to accomplish all things for our salvation. In the night in which he was betrayed, our Lord Jesus took bread, gave thanks, broke it, and gave it to his disciples, saying, Take and eat. This is my body given for you. Do this for the remembrance of me. And again, after supper, he took the cup, gave thanks, and gave it for all to drink, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood shed for you and for all people for the forgiveness of sin. Do this for the remembrance of me. We give thanks to you, O Lord God Almighty, not as we ought, but as we are able. 
And we ask you to mercifully accept our praise and thanksgiving and to bless us, your servants, and these your own gifts of wine and bread, that we and all who share in the body and blood of Christ may be filled with the heavenly blessing of grace. In receiving the forgiveness of sin, may we be formed to live as your holy people and be given our inheritance with all your saints. To you, O God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, be all honor and glory in your holy church, now and forever. Amen. Amen. Lord, remember us in your kingdom and teach us to pray. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done, on earth as in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. Save us from the time of trial and deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power, and the glory are yours, now and forever. Amen. We'll celebrate Holy Communion now together. Um, if you come up row by row, starting with this side, uh, and gather around the altar, then Pastor John and I will come with the elements, the bread and the wine. If you'd rather have grape juice instead of wine, just simply raise your index finger like this to let us know. Uh, and if you're celebrating online, then we ask that when you pass the, the plate, that this is the body of Christ given for you or broken for you. And when you pass the cup, this is the blood of Christ shed for you. But this is Christ's table, and all are welcome here. You are welcome here.
Please stand to receive these final blessings. Now may the body and blood of our Lord Jesus Christ strengthen you and keep you in God's grace. Amen. Amen. Let us pray. Lord of life, in this gift of your body and blood, you turn the crumbs of our faith into a feast of salvation. Send us forth into the world with shouts of joy, bearing witness to the abundance of your love. In Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord. Amen. Amen. People of God, you are Christ's body, bringing new life into a suffering world. The Holy Trinity, one God, bless you now and forever. Amen.